can you speak specifically to how our federal agencies might be able to benefit from the implementation and use of quantum computing? Talking about practical applications, and I'd like to start with Dr. Tahan, Tahan um, and then go down the line. Thank you, Congressman. That's, that's a great question. Let, let me say, as somebody new to industry, you know, nine months in the job, there's tremendous value in a good customer. Like that is maybe the most valuable thing to a company. And the government is the first and best customer for emerging technologies, let's be honest. Like each agency has a mission, whether it's defense, scientific discovery, um, and so on. And I can't say enough about how important it is for them, you know, telling us like this, if you could build a computer like this, our user base at DOE would use it. And let, we'll build to that. You know, so that's first. The second thing is I think there are applications, especially the first ones in science that the Department of Energy, National Science Foundation can foster, where there's really gonna be tremendous discoveries from the computers that we are working with our partners on, like Adam Computing and other mm -hmm. companies are working on. Um, I won't take any more time, but I think there's tremendous opportunity for the government to lead as the first customer. Great, Dr. Chadbolt. Thank you for the question. Uh, the, the government, of course, has been, um, uh, the proponent of high-performance computing historically, building large computers uh, to solve problems in chemistry, material science, physics, uh, et cetera, uh, has been a uh, rightful high-priority activity for governments. And, you know, on the one hand, quantum computing is an alien, you know, sh shocking new technology. On the other hand, it actually bears strong resemblance with those leadership class supercomputers that have previously been built uh, by the national labs, et cetera. And so the way I think about this is that we want to enable a categorically new level of mastery over chemistry, physics, and math. We think that is valuable, and we're happy to be working uh, with uh, Los Alamos National Labs, for example, uh, on, on applications, a number of different groups uh, in, in the US uh, system here. Dr. Chu. Quantum computers can solve problems that AI and supercomputers cannot. We fundamentally believe that there are enormous applications that many of the different US agencies will be able to benefit from. Everything from drug discovery to industrial chemistry to energy and more. Um, we look forward to continued partnership with the agencies as they look at applications and also in direct collaboration with national labs and others. As some of the other panelists have mentioned, supercomputers are incredibly important to the United States and we envision that quantum computers can supercharge that. Okay, Dr. Mitzbacher. One of the major work streams at QADC in partnership with all our members and the government agencies is identifying use cases and they're all publicly available on our website and we've done workshops and, and studies on use cases of quantum for managing the electric grid, for improving transportation systems, for biomedical imaging, that would be quantum sensing, not computing, and uh, other areas. So um, we are helping to identify those use cases so that the agencies will understand the potential of the technology and be early adopters and early customers, as was called for. Thank you. I want to focus on national security issues in this. First of all, the relative value in military terms, we think that Chinese get more value per dollar that we, so how does our 1.2 billion actually compare to their 15 billion? Obviously it's one eighth by normal, but do you, how do you assess our 1.2 billion against their 15 billion in real terms? I'll start and just point out that it's sort of an apples and oranges comparison for one thing. Right. They're investing in buildings and campuses that we don't count in our research budget uh, dollar. And that figure that you quoted, 1.2 billion, I don't believe includes Department of Defense or some of the other agencies that aren't part of the NQI and under the purview of this committee. So um, there are some good numbers for the government spend at quantum.gov. I um, encourage you to take a look at those. Um, but there's there's obviously a lot of um, connection between the basic science and the applications in China and frankly here, as uh, it makes perfect sense. DARPA exists to avoid technological surprise and they're investing a lot in quantum. So um, I think that the question is, you know, are we um, spending our money wisely and uh, not sort of try to necessarily worry about the exact dollar amount and make sure that there aren't holes that need to be filled. And, and Charlie may have additional thoughts from his previous role especially? It's a great question, um, uh, Congressman. Look, there are two 
fundamentally exponentially better applications for quantum computing. One is code breaking, and one is making things. So chemistry, material science. We, as commercial companies, are trying to provide value to a customer. We're trying to create economic value that is legal, right? So we're, we're trying to understand where that market is. If you're more concerned on the code breaking side, like other countries might be, there's a potential huge return on investment. So I'm not worried about the investments today. I don't necessarily believe the numbers we're hearing from other countries. I'm worrying about the investments over the next decade to take our proofs that this is going to scale and really go for it, make the entire ecosystem of fridges, electronics, interconnect, and put it together with a lot of manpower to actually build the machines first. Like whoever gets to that owns the market, not only for the bad, but also for the good. We can't afford to lose that race. Uh, you know, I represent Northwest Indiana, and I'm proud that it's, it's part of the quantum corridor uh, that links Indiana and Illinois. And as you know, the quantum corridor is developing the fastest and most secure fiber optic network in the United States. The hope is that the quantum industry embraces the opportunity to connect into this net network and, and expand upon that. So uh, I know that quantum communications is separate from the quantum computing, uh, but could you talk a little bit about the importance of this corridor and the connections that we're making there? Thank you, Congressman, for the question. Um, yeah, so, uh, so this wafer in front of me, uh, this is a wafer of quantum chips, and this is a photonic wafer, so photons, uh, the same wavelength of light that's used in the internet for networking can fly around on, this, on these chips. Uh, this is made in upstate New York. We make thousands of wafers like this right now. And we're really delighted to be bringing these wafers uh, in the near future to the Midwest, where we're building now large systems, as you've heard. And I think you've also heard from my colleagues, one of the, I think, exciting things about uh, this space is that it is an ecosystem. Uh, Cyquantum works uh, with 500 uh, supply chain partners in 39 states across the, uh, across the US. Um, and that's not just esoteric quantum research. That is cutting steel, uh, making wafers, and making the kind of advanced photonics that is critical for quantum networking, for quantum key distribution, for free space optics, uh, for photonic networking and AI supercomputers. And so I think it's actually very exciting that we can contribute to that, uh, that space, and we can also benefit from work that is done by our colleagues uh, in, in optical networking. So when I took a tour, I think they started out with a four-inch wafer, mm -hmm. which I didn't know anything about at the moment. But anyway, they started out with a four-inch wafer. They went to um, an eight-inch, and now they're up to an 18, which that looks like that's about what? Yes, yeah, so Congressman, if you'll forgive me for uh, opening the case here, because my colleagues would like me to do this. Um, I, do, I do have a big wafer, which I'm happy about. Um, and, and, and this is not just uh, for fun, to your, to your point. One of the things that we've been most focused on in quantum computing is maturity. Uh, of course, quantum computing starts at a very low level of technical maturity in a research lab. And our emphasis has been to urgently escalate to a high level of technical maturity to be able to build the photonic components that you reference in a big fab in the millions. Uh, and we're really excited to now be at that, that point. What risk do you see to that leadership if the federal commitment to quantum research and coordination to plateau or to decline? Thanks for the question, Congressman. Uh, we identify uh, three different risks uh, if the funding were to decline. Number one, and most importantly, is talent for the future workforce. Um, it is incredibly important that we have the talent that we need. Building a quantum computer is an ambitious task. Um, it doesn't just happen by accident. We've got to have the skilled workers. Everything from PhD researchers to engineers to two-year community college technicians, they are all critical to building this, and we need to have that workforce continue to be built up, especially as uh, the industry matures. Um, secondly, supply chain. Um, this is incredibly important. As I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, no one country or company is capable of doing this on our own. We need to have the US government looking at different ways to find and bolster up the supply chain, both domestically and internationally with strategic partners. Uh, and then thirdly, continued funding and support for basic R&D. I can't stress enough, our qubits come out of 
fundamental research that happened in national labs and academia and others supported by the government. This needs to continue. There's a lot of unsolved problems, including all the applications for how a quantum computer will be used. We'd love to see that continued.